Well, good morning, Lighthouse Church. So great to see you uh, on this Sunday morning. Uh, just so excited for what God has in store for us today. Uh, as we conclude our First John series, that's right, today we are in chapter 5 of First John. Come on, if this series, if this study has helped you, can you drop a great big amen in the chat right now? We just believe that God's been speaking to us all about His love and Again, just thinking with all that's going on in our world, there's a lot of things that we can be distracted by. There's a lot of things that are biting for our attention. There's a lot of responses that we can have. But again, the whole point of this series is coming back to the love of God, that really that is the most deep, that is the most profound thing that exists in this world. And it is the love of Jesus Christ. And that's what John, the author of 1 John here, is the best friend of Jesus, uh, has been writing about. And uh, I want to pick up in uh, chapter 5 uh, today and just read a few verses that jumped out to me this week. And uh, I do believe this is going to bless you today. This is going to speak to us. And so uh, 1 John uh, chapter 5, starting in verse 1, it says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out His commands. In fact, this is love for God to keep His commands. His commands are not burdensome for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. If you're taking notes today, I want to speak to you from this title and I want to uh, answer this question. And really, here's, here's the title today. It's God's love language. Did you know that God has a love language? Did you know that God has a way that He, he desires to be loved, just like you and I have a way that we desire to be loved. God has a way that He desires to be loved. And I want to speak today about God's love language. Let's pray as we approach this text together. God, we thank you so much for your word, God, for we do believe that your word, it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And so Holy Spirit, I pray right now that not only do you illuminate scripture, but you lead us to an encounter with Jesus this morning. That God, as we encounter your word through study, through prayer, through worship today, I pray today that we would be forever changed and different as we learn your love language. God, this is, uh, again, this is falling on good soil. God, we, we, we today say we as Lighthouse Church, we are good soil. And so God, would you allow your word, we ask that your word would take root into our hearts and into our lives and that we would respond in complete surrender and obedience to you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, Lighthouse Church. Can we say a great big amen, amen, and amen this morning? Uh, well, I'm sure you are aware of this and, and you've heard of this and there's a great book out. My wife and I uh, went through this book, especially as we were approaching marriage this past week. Uh, speaking of marriage, we just celebrated 10 years of marriage, which we are really uh, excited about and just so crazy how time flies. The last 10 years of our life have flown by, but we're anticipating the next 10 years and then the following 10 years and the following 10 years. And but one of the, the, the books that we uh, read was this book by uh, Dr. Gary Chapman called The Five Love Languages. And uh, really he, he talks about uh, every human being uh, on this earth receives love differently, but really you can boil it down to really five major themes. And, and so uh, he, he talks about that. I wanna give you that today. This will help some context that the, the, the way that we receive love uh, are really five things. And so uh, the first thing uh, mentioned he talks about is gifts. That if you, you love to receive gifts, like when somebody gives you something, it is a great sign that they love you. It's how you feel most loved. Another one is quality time. It matters that, that spending time uh, with somebody that you love, that you cherish, quality times, doing meaningful things together. Another one is acts of service. It says you feel most love 
when somebody does something to serve you, like, like it, I, I feel most loved when somebody is serving me in some capacity. Another one is words of affirmation that you feel most love when somebody looks into your eyes and they start affirming you and encouraging you and telling you how much they love you, how grateful they are for you. And when you hear that, that, that for you is how you receive and you feel love the most. And then he talks about physical touch and that when you receive physical touch, a hug, a handhold, and for us married people, it goes farther and farther than that. But when you actually engage in physical touch, that's how you receive love the most. Now my wife and I, I had to learn this, um, we are incredibly different. Like I, I, I um, uh, thought that my wife just received love the same way that I receive love. And so for me, my, my, my top two ways that I would receive love are through gifts. Like when I receive a gift, I'm telling you, I feel so incredibly loved. And consequently, I love to give gifts. It's one of the things that I enjoy doing is giving gifts. Now, the second way that I receive love and I feel loved the most is, is through words of affirmation. Like when, when, when my wife or somebody would, would, would say something encouraging to me or they would express their love and gratitude and words of affirmation towards me, it's when I feel loved. And so especially for my wife and I, when we were first married, navigating this, I could be busy going through life and going through through ministry and things that we were doing. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, if I shoot her an encouraging text, if I look her into the eyes and tell her how much I love her, and if I get her a gift that th telling her that I'm thinking of her, then she has to know that she is so loved. Well, the truth is, that's not how my wife receives love. My wife's love language, she loves quality time. I mean, you want to minister to her heart. I mean, you, you can sit there with her for hours. I joke about this with her because I say, babe, you love quantity time, right? Uh, but she, she really loves quality time. Doing meaningful things together, being together is how she receives love. She also, she's a physical touch. And so when I hold her hand, I had to learn this in public because I'm not much of a physical touch guy. And so my wife was like, hold my hand. I want to hold your hand when we're walking through the streets, we're walking through the mall. And, and give me a hug more and that's how she receives love. Now we are very different, right? And, and so we've had to, to learn this, but here's ultimately Dr. Gary Chapman's thesis when it comes to this, that people don't receive love until you love them in their love language. So I could give my wife all the gifts in the world. I, I could say all the nice things that I could possibly think of to my wife but she won't adequately receive love until I express it in the way that she receives it. And so till I spend time, quality time with her, until I, uh, the physical touch, I hug her more, I hold her hand, I demonstrate for her a love in how she receives that. So the question I wanna ask you today, Lighthouse Church, is simply this. If God has a love language, what is it? Like if, if God has a love language, what truly is, another way to ask it is this, how do I love God? You ever asked that question? How is it that I love God? Now, I think many of us have gone about life loving God and trying to reach out to God based on how we are wired to receive love. But God actually caused a response for us and He has a way that He likes to receive and to be loved. Now it's interesting as we approach this text, it's the first four chapters of 1 John was really talking about, and the theme of this whole book, right, is God's radical love and our response to His love as we walk in fellowship with Him. That's the theme of 1 John. And so the first four books of this, he really has spent time talking about His love towards you and I. And we've spent four weeks talking about how much God truly does love us. And then finally, we get to chapter five and chapter five, it takes this different approach and it really goes on and it talks about the way that God receives love. How is it that we are supposed to live our life in response to the love that we have received? And so as we, we, we jump into this in, in, in verse one of 1 John chapter five, it says, everyone 
who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. Now I want to just, just, just draw your attention because we have to, to, to create proper theology before we can, can, can dive deep in, into responding to the question of what is God's love language? How do we love God? So we have to dive deep, and he, he, I love the way that he starts this, right? And, and he talks about this belief. Now, the point that I want to demonstrate for us, and what John's trying to communicate is simply this. We don't become children of God by what we do. Rather, we become children of God by what we believe. It's really important, and it's why he talks about belief in Jesus. It's this thought that I can't achieve God, I am to receive God. And we talked about this last week, receiving this free gift of love and salvation and grace and forgiveness that God so freely gives as, as, he, uh, as we rather respond, 1 John 4 tells us that we love because he first loved us. Did you know that Christ is more than just some last name that, that so happened to be ascribed to Jesus. Like it's really important to know the reason why Jesus' name is Jesus Christ because there's power in His name. We sing songs that there's power in the name of Jesus, power to break every chain. Well, why is that? What is that, that, that talking about? Because when you understand and you study the meaning of Christ, it means so much. It actually means the Messiah or the Savior. So you can actually say Jesus Christ or you can say Jesus the Messiah. You can say Jesus the Savior. The Old Testament is full of prophecies from the prophets that were speaking about the Messiah, that were speaking about the Savior, that were speaking about the Christ that was to come, all in reference of Jesus Christ. Now it's really important for us to understand the reason why Jesus' last name is Christ not only represents that He is the Messiah, that He is the Savior, but His name also represents the mission that He is on. So I want you to notice that Jesus' name, it, it, it's not Jesus the economist. It's not Jesus the psychologist. It's not Jesus the president. It's not Jesus the Republican. It's not Jesus the Democrat. It's not Jesus the humanitarian. It's not Jesus the environmentalist. It is Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Messiah. Jesus the Savior. Which would lead us to believe the greatest mission that actually Jesus came to fulfill was in His name. He realized that the greatest need in humanity, it was a sin issue. That has been our greatest sickness. And so God in His love actually came to earth in the form of his son to demonstrate his love for us and Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Savior actually rescued us from the sin that has so easily entangled us. And by doing that, it has restored our relationship with our Father. So the point that I'm trying to illustrate here is this, that our declaration of Jesus as the Christ is the admittance that we are in need of a Savior. That in order to receive God, we have to actually admit that we need Him. And maybe that's where you're at today. If you were to examine your own life, you would say, Pastor, I have been living as my own God, doing what pleases me, do, do, doing what I feel is right in my own eyes. And you're, you, you, the Holy Spirit is starting to work in your life even right now as I'm preaching and I'm highlighting this point. The Spirit of God is at work in your life and you are realizing and coming to this realization as the Spirit enlightens your heart and opens your eyes that you need God. So in order for us to receive it, we have to admit that we need Him. Love the way that Proverbs 14, 12, listen to the way this says because we can get so caught up in doing what we think is right in our own eyes. It says this in Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12, it says, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. There's a way, Lighthouse Church, that appears to be right in our own eyes, but in all actuality, it leads to death. The issue, the challenge with that is we need to obey what it is that God has commanded us. Let me use this analogy, the Titanic. 
Titanic was supposed to be. This unsinkable ship, that was what it was, what it was created to do. That's what it was promoted as. And did you know that when the Titanic actually started sinking, on that ship that night, the, 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 the alarm started going off, the, 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 the panic started settling in as the ship started to sink. But because the people were so convinced that they were on an unsinkable ship, as the ship was sinking, the orchestra kept playing, the people kept dancing all the while the ship was sinking. It was a way that seemed right in their own eyes. But the reality is that they were on a ship that was sinking. What's the point that I'm trying to make? It's not simply an awareness that I am a sinner that compels me to worship God. It is far deeper than that, church, as I've come to the realization that I have been forgiven. I've been forgiven. That, 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 that I have a Savior that has actually saved me from the sinking ship of myself and life and sin. And as I believe and receive that Jesus is the Christ, the one and only Son of God who came to this earth, lived a perfect life, a sinless life, and ultimately was hung and crucified on a cross, laid in a tomb for my sins where he was left for dead, only to three days later rise from the dead, overcoming death, sin, sickness, and disease, all so that I could be in right standing with God so that I could be saved from the very pits of hell from the sin that I was so caught up in and now I, I have a, 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 a spotless relationship with God not based on my doing not based on my merit but based on what I have received as my belief is in Jesus it's important that we have proper theology and that's where John even his last concluding letter in 1st John to this church starts with again demonstrating the proper theology. So as we come to back to our question, what is God's love language? How does God want and desire to be loved? It actually continues on and it says it in our text today. Spoiler alert, it's in our text. Here's what it says in verse 2 in the first part of verse 3. It says this is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out His commands. In fact, here's the answer, church. Here's the answer to the all-important question we've been seeking today. In fact, this is love for God, to keep His commands. This is love for God, to keep His commands. So, so, so based on what Dr. Gary Chapman says, so, so, so does God like to receive gifts? Well, well, yeah, he does. He loves when you actually give, when you actually bring your first fruits, when you live a life of generosity to other people. God loves it when we give to him. Is God love quality time? Well, yes, God loves it when you spend quality time with him. Does God love it when, 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 when we, is, is his love language acts of service? Well, yeah, you're absolutely right. God does love it when we live a life of service and worship back to him. Is God God that loves to receive words of affirmation. Well, yes, that's why we sing songs. We're actually singing songs and we're blessing His name. We're declaring His name. We're thanking Him for being Him. Does God love physical touch? Well, absolutely. He loves when we reach out to Him. And all of those are great. But the truth is, God has one way. He tells us in Scripture that He desires to be loved. And God's love language is this, Lighthouse Church. God's love language is obedience. God desires to be loved as we obey his commands. Obedience is the key to God's heart. Obedience is the key to the supernatural. I do believe that God has great things in store for our life. And my life is a living testimony that when I say, God, I'm obeying you with my entire life. I'm obeying you with the next step. It is amazing how faithful God has been time and time again. But here's the challenge. The challenge of obedience, church, is this. 
because it's really easy to obey God if we simply believe he's leading us into a mountaintop or into success or into blessing. But the challenge of obedience is, will I obey the commands of God if they lead me into a fire, if they lead me into a valley, if they lead me into a challenging season? If it leads me even into a flood, if it leads me to carrying my cross, will I continue to obey God and to love him back the way he desires to be loved? It's a great question that we have to ask and wrestle with this morning because I think it's many of our modern Western Christianity loves to obey God when things are good in our life. And we think that God's going to just give us blessing after blessing after blessing well yes you're right God's blessing you but it doesn't look anything how our mind thinks blessing should look some of the blessings that God wants to give us actually lead us into the fiery furnace Shadrach Meshach and Abednego some of the blessing that God leads us to is actually into a flood Noah some of the blessing that God leads us to is actually a cross Jesus Some of the blessing that God leads us to is into a valley, David. Many of us have to wrestle and honestly answer the question, the challenge of obedience. Will I obey God even if it leads me into a difficult season? So I'm going to give you just three quick things today, three, three things around obedience to encourage you with. And really, as your pastor, I want to help pastor you today. I want to help pastor you on this wonderful Sunday. And so I want to give you three quick points around obedience and, and when it comes to obeying God and His commands and loving God the way that He desires to be loved. Point number one, if you are taking notes, the first point is this. Obedience starts as an option. Obedience starts as an option you have a decision to make lighthouse church like 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 for me i have a decision every morning that my alarm goes off as early as it does i have a decision to make every morning Part of my morning routine is I like to get up early. I like to spend time with God, get into his word and pray. And I like to get a workout in before my day gets going. So when my alarm goes off, I'm faced with the decision. Do I push the snooze button and disobey my alarm, breaking away from the routine? And many of you probably are faced with those same decisions in the morning. But here's what I know. Um, I've never regretted as challenging as it has been of getting out of bed some mornings. I've never regretted actually getting out of bed and doing and walking into my routine. What I have regretted church is the times that I have pressed snooze because it felt good in the moment. Just a five more minutes, just 10 more minutes, just another hour of sleep. If I press snooze, it feels really good in the moment, but later that day, almost every single time I lead to a place of regret as if, man, why do I feel so sluggish? Why do I feel so off? Every single day, church, we are faced with an option. And that option is will we obey God even if it's difficult, even if it's challenging. Another way that we can look at it, and we have to go to this side of it, um, uh, and I want to just, just, just talk to, to Christians for a moment. If you are a follower of Jesus, that's what a Christian means. It means a little Christ. It means a little follower of Jesus, which is what we're trying to be. We're trying to be examples of the great example that was set for us as he transforms our lives, as we admit he is the savior of our life. And so as Christians, let, let me just, 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 just go here, uh, and I want to pastor you for a moment and, and talk about this uh, blatant disobedience like like we, 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 can, we can go in you don't need me to expose all of the, the, the sins that are out there Holy Spirit does that I mean we, we can talk about greed we can talk about anger we can talk about lust we can talk about unforgiveness we can talk about bitterness we can talk about offense and on and on and on and on the question I have for you Lighthouse Church is simply this if you know that it breaks the heart of God Why do you think it will fulfill yours? If you know that the decisions that you're making, the options that you're choosing are are blatantly breaking the heart of our Father, of our Creator, 
Why is it that we think it will fulfill ours? But a moment, just like when I hit that snooze button, feels really good in the moment. But I always regret it later. If we know it breaks the heart of God, why is it that we think it will fulfill ours? Let me, let me, let me say it this way. If Jesus is not Lord of all, Jesus isn't Lord at all. He either has all of my life, like there is no part-time Christians. There is no part-time Christianity. There is no just, I'm a Christian on Sunday and I show up for Sunday worship and I do the dance thing and I sing the songs and right now I comment in the chat and when we come back to the building, I'm here in the building, but then Monday through Saturday, I'm about myself. I'm about living my life, doing what I wanna do, doing what pleases me. Listen, e either Jesus is Lord of your entire life or is not Lord at all. And I know this, that Jesus wants our entire hearts. And here's the good news, good news, good news I wanna give you, and I would be remiss to not go here. And actually John goes here in the second part of verse three. He says, and his commands are not burdensome. The commands of God, so, so the way that, that, that he desires to be loved, church, he actually goes on and says that those commands that, that he asked of us, it is not burdensome. Like it, it's not weighing us down. And this is a good thing because when you are in a relationship with God, you understand that you have a loving and gracious Father that loves you so much and cares for you. And he's actually given us commands to protect us. Because he loves us so much. And so when it comes to the commands of God, it's not like this, this weighty, burdensome thing that I have to do. And it actually is this freeing thing that because I've had a revelation of who God is and I know how much he loves me and I know the plans he has for my life and I just so desire to, to continue to be a vessel for him, guess what? I know he's got some commands to protect me, protect me from myself to protect me from my destiny, to protect my family, to protect my ministry. God has a plan for every single one of our lives and His commands are actually to help protect us out of His love that He has for us. Here's the point that I'm trying to communicate. You will never allow God to lead you until you know how much He loves you. You'll never allow God to lead you until you actually know how much He loves you. Like, the fastest way, church, to destroy your destiny, your future, what's ahead for you, is to disobey God. <laughs> but because I know He loves me, He cares for me, and He desires to be loved, and the way that He desires to be loved is as we respond and we obey His commands. Second, point when it comes to the challenge of obedience and, and the opportunities and choices that we have to make. Number two, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Obedience finds opportunities. Obedience finds opportunities. Did you know that when we obey God, when we obey His commands, here's what we're doing. We're actually blessing God. Did you know that you could actually bless God with your life? Like, like it's not just about receiving blessings from God, but my life could actually be a blessing to God. How is it that I do that? Well, I simply obey the commands that he has set before me. My wife, she, she, she's very aware of, uh, of, of how I receive love and, and gifts and words of affirmation and Occasionally, I'll, I'll go and I'll, I'll travel somewhere to preach, whether it's to do an event or something. And almost every time that I pack a, a suitcase to go on a trip like this, she finds a way in either a backpack or in my Bible. She writes a love note, an encouraging word, somewhere that I will discover at some point on this trip. And I'm telling you, almost every time, it is what I need to read as soon as I discover it. Why is it that this is important? Because she has discovered how I desired to be loved. And even at moments when she says things that, that she's like, you are an incredible leader, 
oh, I don't feel like a great leader. You are an amazingly gifted preacher. I, I don't feel like a gifted preacher. You're an amazing husband. I, I don't feel like an amazing husband. What she's doing is she's encouraging words of affirmation. She's prophesying over my life. And as I read it based on how I receive love, what's happening in me is there's a bigger man inside of me. The Spirit of God is welling up on the inside of me as I'm receiving this. And so when I say that obedience finds opportunity, she finds opportunity to bless me. She, 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 she looks for these opportunities that she knows will minister to me and to bless me. Now, if this is true in a human sense, how much more important is it for us to live our lives as a blessing to God, church? How is it that we do that? We live our life in obedience to God. Listen to, to, to verse 4. Because some of you, you, you might be stuck right now. And listen, listen, listen to this. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4 says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Here's what John is saying. John is saying this, that obedience creates opportunity to overcome. Obedience creates an opportunity to overcome. So the question I have for you, Lighthouse, is what's holding you back? What, what, what chains are you bound by and are you stuck in right now? Is it fear? Is it worry? Is it anxiety? Is it stress? What, what, what is holding you back in this season? And might I just suggest for your pastoral consideration in your life that maybe what is holding you back, when I obey God, it gives me the opportunity to overcome what's holding me back. That's what John's saying. He, he's saying, you want to overcome the world? You want to overcome the challenges of this world? The things that can so easily entangle us and hold us back? How is it that I overcome them? Well, I obey the commands of God. And I'm telling you as a firsthand account of my life personally, it's amazing that when I obey the commands of God, how free my life becomes not bound by anything, insecurities, and challenges, and pride, and things that life may throw at me, that when I'm all caught up in myself, it's easy to get entangled in. When I come to obey God, and I understand that I have an opportunity, that obedience is actually knows that there's an opportunity, and I'm just telling you, there's opportunities that we have every day when we obey God. Now, here's what we have to understand, and I'll use this analogy. For me, I, I showed some of you a picture of when uh, just over 10 years ago, I was about 65 pounds heavier than I am right now. I was standing uh, in at about a solid 217 pounds at five foot eight, okay? And I just really loved donuts. I loved appetizers at Applebee's. I, I loved food, right? And I had to get a grip on that. Now, when I was first starting out in this health journey and in this health transformation, um, there, I, I so easily got caught up in temptations of quick fixes. So, so it was, it was whether it was a fad diet or it was a quick fix to something. And here's what I learned is that those quick fixes, though they, they, they may have, have temporarily worked, it wasn't sustainable in the long run. That it wasn't until I actually developed a healthy routine and a healthy pattern and a healthy daily choice and decisions that I was going to make that it ultimately led me now to 10 years later being where I'm at today. What is it that I'm trying to say? I'm trying to say there are no shortcuts to obedience. There is no just quick fix to obedience, that obedience is an everyday decision that we have to answer to God to say, God, either I'm going to obey you today, I'm going to obey your commands, I'm going to bless your name, I'm going to be a blessing to you, and I'm surrendering my life, and I'm choosing to live it this way. I love the way Eugene Peterson says it. He says it's a long obedience in the same direction. This journey of following Jesus, it is a long obedience. In the same direction, day by day, making a choice to obey God. Listen to the way Isaiah 40 verse 31 says it. It says, but those who wait on the Lord. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings with e like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. 
There are no shortcuts when it comes to obeying God. And so my encouragement to you, church, you, you, you've got a, a dream in your heart. You, you've got a God-given thing, a God-given dream, a God-given purpose placed in your life. What's the greatest way to get there? And I'm not going to say that you're going to be there tomorrow. You may not even be there 10 years from now. But I do know the dreams, the desires, and the destiny that God has for your life, it comes from a lifetime of making obedient decisions every single day of our life. And by the time that we get to realizing that the dream that God's placed in our life comes to fruition, we look back in our life and we can say it was a long obedience in the same direction. No shortcuts. Third and final point, and I'm going to ask Tyler to make me sound spiritual. Third and final point I want to encourage you with is this, that obedience, when we choose obedience, obedience becomes an overflow becomes an overflow of who we are. Listen to the way verse 5 says it. It says, who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. You can go and you can study that word believes. Another, another term we can place there, I think is a little bit better translated, is, is trust. It says the one who trusts that Jesus is God. So when I trust that Jesus is God, here's what I realize, and here's the point that we're trying to communicate, is that obedience is less about trying and more about trusting. It's less about trying to do and it's more about trusting God for who He is. And it's amazing, even well-seasoned believers. Uh, I'm talking to some of you right now who have been following Jesus for so long. And if you were to be honest and examine your life, and I were to ask you this question, does God have your entire heart? Have you surrendered your life completely? What I'm actually asking you is, do you trust God totally? Do you trust God in the area of your life that, that maybe you haven't fully surrendered to Him? Because we have to come to, 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 to a decision that says that, that, you know what? My obedience to God is not about all the doing, but it really is about trusting God for who He is. And I know what you're thinking right now. And this is what many of us end up struggling with. Well, why does God want that? Well, why does God do that? Let, let, let me say it this way. I remember being a teenager. And I remember my, 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 my dad, my mom, they had a, a set of rules in our household. Things, the commands that we were to obey, a, a really values that we were going to operate by as a family. And when I would go against and disobey and challenge those rules, as an immature teenager, what would I say to my father? Well, why? Why do I have to obey that? Why is it that I have to do that? Why, 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 why? And my response during those times was always the why. And here's the gracious thing about my father, and it's a great picture of our heavenly father, that even when I was struggling and asking the why, as a rebellious teenager, my dad continued to love me because here's what, what he was demonstrating, is his love for me is not based on my worth. His love for me is based on birth. And so when I realize, even as an immature teenager, asking God why, I realize now looking back that actually my father and my mom and, and the rules that were set up in the house was actually to protect me was actually to guide me. And why was it? Because they loved me so incredibly much. So it wasn't about them just trying to dictate my schedule and dictate my life and tell me all the things that I can't do. And then me in frustration as an immature teenager respond with why, 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 why? No, now I realize looking back that they loved me and they were protecting me. And it wasn't because of my worth. Because if it was because of my worth, there are times that, that the way that I responded as a teenager did not deserve to be loved. But they didn't love me based on my worth. They loved me based on birth. And here's the good news for those of us who are Jesus followers. And if you're considering to be a Jesus follower, the scripture talks about this idea of being born again or being rebirthed. Well, what does that mean? It's saying that I am now, by placing faith, by receiving Jesus for who he completely is, what's happening in my life is I am being born again, a new creation 
And so now God loves me, not based on my worth, not based on my merit, but now he loves me based on my rebirth, based on the fact that I have received his son. I have received Jesus. And as I receive Jesus, I wanna bless his name because I know how much he loves me. I know that he's got great things in store for me. I know he cares so deeply. And so it's way less about the rules. And I wanna obey the commands of God because I know he loves me so incredibly much. He's trying to protect me from myself. He's trying to protect me from the harm that I could do to myself and others. He's trying to protect me from getting off track in this life. And so no longer now, looking back as I'm growing, as my maturity as a believer, no longer do I respond to God and say, well, God, why these commands and why that and why this? But rather I say, God, you love me. You've got great things in store for me. And as I've been born again, spirit-filled child of God, I just know that you are protecting me, you're leading me, and you're guiding me as I, I, I take this long obedience in the same direction. Obedience, church, obedience becomes an overflow. And it's a lot less about, well, am I going to do right? Am I going to do wrong? No, I know God loves me and I want to bless his name and I want to please his heart and I'm going to continually li live my life blessing his name, obeying his commands. I love the way Proverbs says it. This is what's important as we close. Proverbs 4, 23, it says, above all else, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Here's, here's the truth. If your heart is right, your actions follow. It's only been in times in my life where there's been great deep conflict in my heart that my actions have lashed out in wrong ways. But when I know that my heart is good, my heart's in the right place, it's amazing how my response towards this life, why? Because the Proverbs tells us so very clearly, above all else, guard our heart, because out of it flows wellsprings of life, and other translations will say. And so, as we come to a close in this series, Lighthouse Church, God loved us in our love language. I want us to realize that today. That you have actually, God has demonstrated his love for you based on your love language. And this is good news because for those of you that receive it in words of affirmation, he tells us in scripture time and time again that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, that you're a child of God, that you're a royal priesthood, that you're above and not beneath, that you're the head and not the tail. His scripture, his word, I'm telling you church, is so full of words of affirmation for your life. And he actually wants to demonstrate how much he loves you. For those of you that receive love in words of affirmation, a great encouragement would be to open this book and allow God, allow scripture to minister to you maybe you, you enjoy acts of service and that's how you receive love what well, the good news is is Jesus demonstrated for us what the greatest act of service was by laying down his life for us in an act of service for you and I to restore this relationship with God that has been broken and so if you're saying well I, I'm about acts of service well God continues to serve and work in our life and there is no farther and greater demonstration than laying down his life for you and I maybe you're saying well I like gifts and I like to receive gifts. Well, the good news is, is that he bought us back. God paid the ultimate price by laying down his life for you and I. He paid for the ransom and the sin of your life, leading us to salvation. It cost God everything. And he invested everything that he had to purchase you back. And so if you love to receive gifts, oh, there's good news that you have been bought at the highest price. And the good news is, is as a spirit-filled believer, he's continuing to give us good gifts, gifts that go on to and minister to others as a spirit-filled life there's fruit in our, that comes out of our life and he actually has gifts that he wants to give us as we walk in obedience every single day of our life gifts to encourage others gifts to prophesy over other people gifts of discernment to give somebody gifts of knowledge to give somebody I'm telling you God is always giving gifts and so if you receive love by receiving gifts God's got gifts he's want to give you and let us look no farther than the fact that he bought you and I he paid the ultimate 
ultimate price, maybe your physical touch. Hey, maybe you're like, I, I like to be th this physical touch. And I'm telling you the physical touch of Jesus we see time and time again. The truth is, is that God is at work on the inside of us. His spirit actually lives in us. And so he's touching us every single day of our life. And so when we say, God, I'm reaching out to you, the truth is God is with us. He's omnipresent, meaning he's with us everywhere that we possibly go. And so I just believe that the physical, tangible presence of God, when I take a moment and I realize that he's with me, he's actually hugging me, receiving me. He actually welcomes us with open arms. And so maybe for some of you, you're saying, man, I, I feel like I need a hug. I feel like I need to be embraced. Well, the good news is, is God's arms are standing there and he's waiting for you to take a step towards him because he's right behind you. And as you turn towards him and say, God, I want you, he doesn't look at you and say, get away from me, you dirty, nasty, broken sinner, but rather he embraces you with all that he has because he's reaching out to touch you. And maybe you're saying, I like quality time and I receive gifts in quality time. Well, the good news is God is always with you. His scripture tells us he'll never leave us nor forsake us. So the good news is for those of you who are feeling lonely right now, he's never left us. He's been with you all the entire time. And so the, our response to that is coming to the realization that even in my loneliness, I know that God is with me in my midst, that wherever I go, God is right there spending time with me. And so our response, as God has demonstrated for you and I, He's actually loved us in the way that we've been, we, we, we've been wired to receive love. I think it's our duty, church, to respond to God and love him back, not based on how we want to be loved, but based on how he desires to be loved. And as this series comes to a conclusion, Lighthouse Church, I'm telling you that God desires obedience. And our lives can get caught up in so many things. And this is a pastoral alert, a pastoral recommendation. If you are not living for Christ, if you are caught up in your sin, repent and turn to God and receive his forgiveness, receive his grace. And right now, if you're saying, Pastor, I want to make this decision decision today. I want to make this decision to follow Jesus. I want to obey his commands. And as I evaluate my life, the truth is I haven't been living for him. I've been blatantly disobeying God. And today I want to repent. And whether it's for the very first time that I'm turning to him or as a radical recommitment, I'm saying, God, today is the day on this Sunday in 2020, in the midst of all that's happening in our world, this was the day that I repented. This was the day that I turned to God. This was the day that I made a decision that God I'm going to choose to love you how you desire to be loved and that is to obey your commands as a recipient of your love you say how do I do that pastor it's simply by crying out to God right now on your couch, right now in your bedroom, right now in your living room, right now wherever you may be watching from, from wherever in the world that you're watching from God wants this to be the day the question is, is will you surrender your life completely to God. How? It's by crying out to God. It's by receiving. How do I receive this? Scripture tells us in Romans that when we confess with our mouth, and we believe in our heart, belief, that's what we talked about, we opened up with, we believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. It's as simply as it it's put. So today, if that's you, you're saying, Pastor, I'm responding to God, you'll, you'll see a raise hand button come across in the chat right now. We ask you to do this because we want to know who we're agreeing with in prayer this morning. We want to agree with you. We want to celebrate with the heavens with who that is. And if that is you, I do want to close this message. And maybe you're, 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 you're one of the 50 or so people that in the last four months have made a decision to follow Jesus. And you're saying, well, what are some next steps? What, what, what can I do? One of the very practical things that we want to do is we want to be able to send you a book in the mail that answers some of these questions about what it means to follow Jesus. This book runs parallel with scripture. So you're going to simply, you'll see come across the screen right now in a slide, you're going to text the word fresh start to the number 805, I believe it's 321, 1818. You can simply text fresh start and it'll link you back with a, a few questions. And we actually wanna send in the mail something that's gonna help you. And if you need anything, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Do not let this opportunity go by. Let today be the day 
that God radically got a hold of your life, not based on your merit, not based on your doing, but as a recipient of his love, we are choosing today, Lighthouse Church, to respond to God, to love him back, how he desires to be loved, and that is simply by obeying his commands. God, I thank you for your church. Holy Spirit, I thank you for the work that you're doing in all of our lives. God, I thank you that you are still at work, even in this difficult season. You are meeting us right where we're at. You're meeting us in our homes. You're meeting us in our bedrooms. And God, I'm just, 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 just again praying that, that as the message, as your word is being communicated today, God, we're saying this is falling on good soil. And God, our desire, it truly is to respond and love you back, not based on how we desire to be loved, but how you have so clearly communicated you desire to be loved and that is as we obey your commands in Jesus name we pray and Lighthouse Church can we say a great big amen this morning well hey before you go today I'm going to close service